For 140 years, puffers were the workhorses of the Scottish coastal trade. Those days are long gone, and now with only three of these historic boats left in Scottish waters, I'm on a voyage into a steam-driven past. Whoa. The heat! Where the puffers would help fire the industrialization of our nation and provided the crucial link between the mainland and our remotest communities. I thought of these men as heroes, coming with these wee boats to the islands, doing such good work. I'll meet the last surviving men who lived and worked on these special craft. So there are not many of them left now. I mean, I'm 86, but I'm still one strong. <laughs> the puffers were immortalised by the fictional tales of Parahandi and the vital spark. And the reality behind the myth is every bit as rich as the Parahandi tales. What are rogues too, but you know, they were good, they were nice rogues, you know. <laughs> Let's find out more about the boat that built Scotland. The River Clyde, the artery that runs through the heart of Glasgow, will forever be associated with the magnificent ships that were built here during the British Empire's age of industrial and world domination. The great ships that were built on this river sailed away from Scotland to distant lands to make their fortune and ply their trade. But there's another fascinating part of Scotland's maritime history, and it's a story that's almost been forgotten. For more than a century, the Clyde Puffer was a familiar sight on Scottish water. There were around 400 of these boats built, and while some puffers were owned by their skipper, most were part of private company fleets. They were manned by small crews of some of the hardiest and most able men that have ever taken to the rough seas of Scotland, and could deliver over 100 tonnes of bulk cargo with her own gear in places other vessels dare not go. Most versatile boat in the water, she was just as at home in the industrial heart of Scotland as she was in the remotest corners of the Hebrides. I'm looking at an old map of Scotland and you can see the graphic nature of, of our landscape and the highlands and the islands. And it's craggy with all the inlets and the sea locks and these inaccessible isolated communities. Now, to get any kind of supplies in there, you needed a specially designed and built boat to do that job. And that's where the puffers came in. Difficult, difficult job, but absolutely vital to the lifeblood of those communities. The Clyde Puffer, the boat that once played such an important role in Scottish life, has all but disappeared. Well, almost. I'm at Crinan in Argyllshire, on the west coast of Scotland. It's a haven for sailors from all over the world, and I'm here to visit a very important piece of Scottish maritime history. And here she is, the Vic 32. This unique boat is the last surviving steam-driven puffer still to be found on Scottish water. She's like a clumpy lump of iron sitting in the water, isn't she? I'm dying to see inside. The Vic 32 has been kept afloat by the last full-time puffer skipper in the world, Nick Walker. Nick. Hello, sir. Very, very welcome. It's on lovely board to be here. Good ship, Vic 32. Nick's agreed to let me join him on a voyage that will help me find out what life was like on board the working puffer. Take out the slack as I come back. But she's quite a beast to move around this little well, log. Yeah, she weighs 160 tons, so, and there are a lot of very expensive um, yachts about the place. 
so you've got to be quite careful. <laughs> and you wouldn't be very happy if you uh, no. bumped into them. No. No. I'm coming astern. This boat would, will, will do ballet. You can turn the boat round in a canal basin like this. So that little wheel controls the engine? It's the throttle, it's the, it's the main steam valve. It just allows more steam or less steam into the engine. Well, you can hold the wheel. So you turn it to the middle. That's it, keep turning. This is a treat beyond belief. This is the first time that I've been on a steam puffer. But like a lot of Scots of a certain vintage, it's a boat that I remember well. Now, I, as a boy growing up in Glasgow, um, you know, we used to a ferry across the river, the Govan Ferry, to visit my auntie. And you would have dozens and dozens of ships and liners from all over the world. Then amongst them were these things puffing away, puff, 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 plying their trade up and down the Clyde. And there was something, I mean, in the minds of a young boy, they were magical little, they were like little toys, toy ships. They weren't great big ocean-going liners or cargo ships. They were just wee toys. You wanted to have them in your bath. Puffers, too, have their place in Dockland, for these dumpy little maids of all work carry their cargoes right up to the shallows under the city's bridges. The Vic 32 here was built in 1943, and after her working life was headed for the breaker's yard. Thankfully, she was rescued by Skipper Nick when he spotted her laid up at a boatyard in Whitby. And he's kept her afloat by converting her cargo hold and turning her into a popular holiday cruiser. If we hadn't found her in September of 1975, I think she would have been scrapped because she was going downhill fast. And the anchor chain had gone, the navigation lights had gone, the wheel had gone, you know, she was just, the core was there. And together with the help of some steam enthusiasts, spent two years doing all the work that you can see and we managed to get her going because I knew nothing about steam engines but we we soon worked it out that uh, this boat had a heart. The Vic 32 is now the last of her kind but puffers just like her used to be a regular sight all along this Argyllshire coastline but it was on a different type of waterway that the story of these boats really began. Now, the story of Scotland's puffers is fundamentally interwoven with the history of Scotland's canals. And if you want to find out about the birth of the puffer, you won't find it out to sea. You have to head inland. And it's back to Glasgow, on one of Scotland's most historic waterways, that the story begins. In many respects, the puffer was the baby of the Forth and Clyde Canal. This is the Forth and Clyde Canal system, and you could spend your entire life in this city of Glasgow going about your daily business, and you would never know it's here. But in the days of the puffers, these waterways were the veins of the nation carrying Scotland's lifeblood, trade. The canal is 35 miles long and cuts right across Scotland at her narrowest point between Grangemouth in the east and Bowling in the west. When it opened in 1790, it was the most important trade route in Scotland. Steam power in boats had yet to be perfected and cargo was delivered using a tamer method. And it's from these earliest canal craft the puffer would emerge. Over there, hiding in the long grass is something I find quite remarkable. This is an old canal scow. The forerunner, the granddaddy of the puffers. And already you can see the basic puffer design begin to take shape. She had no engines and no steerage system. Apart from that hand-operated tiller you can see at the stern there, because these boats were pulled along the canals by horses in the 18th and first half of the 19th centuries. Now, she's not been cared for by restoration teams. She's just been left here to rust into memory. And that's a shame because she played a vital part in Scottish maritime history. 
In the 1830s, the canals would face a serious threat. These horse-drawn scows would be overtaken by a new, faster, steam-powered rival. The age of the railway had arrived. But the key thing was efficiency. And the railways thought that they had the upper hand and that they could develop um, a more efficient system. The puffer was the solution to this. This was a really important part of the canal. In 1856, a canal engineer called James Milne, who lived in that white house behind me, here in Hamilton Hill in the north of Glasgow, decided to try an experiment. He installed two steam cylinders and a newly invented screw propeller into the iron hull of a cargo scow. And the Thomas was born, the first ever puffer. And once that boat had been uh, uh, converted, um, it was immediately popular. The big advantage the Forth and Clyde Canal had was the size, the sheer size of the Forth and Clyde Canal meant that boats could be developed that were big enough to, in effect, compete against railways. These locks uh, on the canal uh, will take a boat 66 feet long. Uh, so that was the dimension that the, the, the puffers were all built to, to begin with. The average puffer took about 100 tonnes of goods. You couldn't put that on a railway truck. It minimised also the amount of handling that you had to do to shift the goods. These new puffers were an instant success and they soon became a familiar sight as they gave the canals a new competitive edge. I'm on board the MV Mary Hill, a miniature replica puffer run by canal enthusiasts. It gives us a wonderful glimpse into the past as the journey along here is the same route taken by those first puffers. There's a steeple of Glasgow University then below that, the Western Infirmary. I've lived in Glasgow all my life and I've never seen the city from this perspective. It's really, really unusual and it's, it's lovely. The early puffers were really simple boats. They were essentially just canal barges with an engine bolted onto the back. It was this rudimentary design that led to its name. The first generation of puffers did not have condensers which meant that they could not convert the steam back into water um, to go back into the boiler. They just let it puff out of the funnel. Puff, puff, puff. And of course, those early puffers with non-condensing engines uh, on the canal, puff, puff, puff through the, the, the funnel, is where the name puffer comes I from. The name. the name stuck. And although the model adapted, puffers they were to their dying day. When you think of the heyday of shipbuilding, it's really almost impossible not to conjure up images of the great yards of the day. The Fairfields, the Elders, the Yarrows and the John Browns. But alongside that at the same time, a new industry of canal-side puffer boatyards was developing, and developing fast. Industries sprang up alongside the canal, and the puffer was part of that whole new industrial mobility. Uh, I'm watching the only known footage of a broadside launch of a puffer and it's in the heart of the town of Kirkintilla, Sidon. And it looks amazing because the, the boat, when it's being built, must have towered right above the canal bank in the centre of the town. Oh! Oh, wow! <laughs> that's... Good Lord! That's really genuinely quite spectacular. I mean, when she slides off into the canal, she bounces about like a cork, like a matchbox and she crashes into the other bank and sending a great wave onto the shore. That's quite spectacular, that. There are thousands of people around there watching. This is a remarkable piece of footage, and it's very, very rare. Although the puffers started out life on the gentle waters of the canals, 
It was out in the open sea on the wild west coast of Scotland they would make their name. And for Professor Donald Meek, who grew up in the remote island of Tyree in the early 50s, the importance of the puffer has left a lasting impact. I miss the puffer terribly. I was so used to puffers coming and going to Tyree for all sorts of reasons. I'm often amazed at this, that a little boat that was developed to handle bulk cargo on a canal eventually went out to the Hebrides. The puffer is how the Industrial Revolution spread out to the Hebrides, like the spokes of a wheel from Glasgow and from the Lowlands. And the puffers were the spokes. There was a fortune to be made if the puffers could get out to sea and work the coastal trade. But before they could reach the open water beyond the canal locks, a few design modifications needed to take place. And deep in the archives of the Scottish Maritime Museum at Irvine, we can find the earliest example of the puffer's evolution. Now, what makes these blueprints so special is the fact that they're so rare. The puffers built in the first 50 years of the trade were built by eye. But then when they started to add amendments and new elements for ocean going, that's when these blueprints first arrived. So out at sea, obviously, they needed a bulwark, a rail around the outside of the boat to stop people falling off. Common sense. When they were in the canals, they had an open cargo hold. You know, if water got into an open hold out at sea, that would lead to a pretty awful disaster. So they had to add covers and hatches all over the boat. And the canal system was very easy and straightforward to steer. A simple rudder was all that was needed. But once they started going out into the open sea, they needed something far, far more robust. But a key development would be in engines. What the canal puffers did was they took the water from the canals and blew it up their chimneys. They puffed. But you can't do that out at sea because you can't use salt water. The engines just wouldn't work. So they created a condenser. So there was no more puffing. By the 1890s, with these refinements and developments in place, the steam puffer finally took on the shape it would retain for the next 70 years. With the puffer now ready for a life at sea, it would go on to dominate the Scottish coastal trade. There are probably only a handful of men now who actually sailed on puffers. We're just at the point where we could lose that wonderful link with a generation of men who were adept at handling small steam craft in difficult waters and doing so brilliantly. One man who knows more than most about life aboard these special boats is retired puffer skipper Bobby Sinclair. Bobby, you've done that before. <laughs> when you're trying. Good to meet you, yes. pal. How are you? Welcome. Bobby, why did you join? Well, I suppose I was in the boats with my father. He, he was on the boats and I always used to come out to school and first thing was down to the boat. So your father was a puffer man? That's correct, yeah. He was a puffer for many years as well. So yeah. when did you start to work full time? I the started when I was 16 in the puffers. And that was uh, the Lasker, a puffer called the Lasker. Steam puffer, my father was a skipper. And uh, started off the deck hand. The deck hand of a steam puffer had to relieve the engineer, and you were down there, down firing up the boiler there, and sometimes the skipper would have you steering, and save, save him steering, <laughs> and things like that, you know. But you ended up a skipper, didn't you? Aye, yes. Got one command, and worked up till about the mid-70s, early 70s. I imagine, the, you know, the conditions under which you worked, and the conditions of the weather and all the rest of it, it must have generated a great strength of camaraderie and a, a oh, sense did, of community yeah. amongst oh, you all. Okay. I mean, you, you wouldn't see anything going wrong. You would look after one another as well, you know. A lot of rogues too, but you would, mm -hmm. they, were, they were good, they were nice rogues, you know. <laughs> Are you proud of being in Spartan? Oh, yes, very proud of being in the Spartan. Why? Yes. 
Oh, well, else is a fine wee boat, a nice fine, fine wee boat to look at, nice model. One of the puffers that Bobby was proud to have worked on during his long career at sea is now being looked after by the Scottish Maritime Museum. This is the Spartan, birthed here in Irving Harbour. It's one of the last of the puffers still afloat. Another man who can remember life working on the Spartan was her former chief engineer, Jim McMonigal. I joined this boat somewhere about 1962. The last porthole there was my cabin, and there were three of us in that. On the other side, the skipper, he had a cabin to himself. We got class distinction. But there were a happy enough crowd. Down at the back end, down a couple of steps, there was a mess room with a stove and a cooker in it. No refrigeration or anything like that. But we all worked together and you you had to get on. If you, you didn't had get, to get on, on yes. you were in serious trouble because it's true we are boat to, unless you started fighting. But we thoroughly enjoyed it, we had a great time on it. It was the hardest job I had in my life. I really? learned the puffers. I've never worked so hard physically in my life. Because if you had 80 tonne of coal in that hold, and if you were in a place where you didn't have dockers, you did the loading yourself. You didn't have a shovel eight hours a day, and we had to discharge 80 tonne of coal in a day. 80 tonnes? 80 tonne. Coal was the key cargo carried by the puffers in these massive holds. And the guys who worked on board weren't just expected to be able seamen. Their main job was to load and unload these huge cargoes by hand. We always used to start about seven o'clock in the morning there. The lorries would be sitting waiting on you. And oh, it was brutal work. These number 10, there was big number 10 shovels into these tubs. Big coal, big coal in these days. There was none of this kind of small cobbles you get now. Oh, it was bloody work. Life certainly wasn't easy on board the buffer. Hard physical work. Oh, you can almost sense the presence of those men. Loading and unloading this great cargo hold. And the other key element, of course, about a puffer was that she could load and unload uh, under her own steam. Uh, hence the mast and derrick that you see in all the pictures. Uh, so they could, they could do that at any point along the canal or indeed at any point out in the Western Isles. I heard one guy lost his leg in a, in a rope in a winch. And there were various other accidents, you know, because uh, Health and safety didn't come into it. Just uh, go on with the job. <laughs> one man went on the derrick, and one went on the winch, and two went down the hole. And you shoveled coal to your dropping. And we got overtime for that. And I always remember we got the princely sum of one and six an hour. Now, if you can get somebody to help to shovel 150 tons for one and six an hour, they're off the beam. <laughs> the money was never that great the, on the boats. Not for the hours we were putting in anyway. I think it was about 84 hours a week we were working. 84? Yeah, that was it. That, that was just the way it went. So it, it was very, very hard work. But you know, we were fit. I mean, I'm 86, but I'm still going strong. <laughs> you don't look a day over 60, Jim. Ah, that's what I say too. But inside I'm not so good, but I'm keeping going, no problems. And I think that's largely due to having worked in the puffers for it built you in stamina. You've kept you fit and kept you strong. You kept you going. I remember, I remember nearly wrecking a, a Bedford lorry one time with discharging sand and I was mating a puffer and we were, we were unloading my grab, we had a grab for, for oh. sand. I was loading his lorry up, I didn't know anything about lorries and I, and I loaded it right up. The lorry fell apart because an old bed for the, probably held up three tonne, I think about ten or twelve tonne of sand on it. <laughs> I'm heading down into the beating heart of the puffer, 
the life and soul of the ship. The engine room. Ooh. The 72-year-old engine of the Vic 32 is maintained and stoked by dedicated young steam engineer, Matt Scurr. Matt, hi. Nice. How, How are you? Are you? Good to see you. Whoa. The heat. That's warm, isn't it? The noise, man. Look at that. Looking in that firebox Ooh. at about 1,400 degrees. Whoa. Gives us that lovely 120 psi of pressure the engines like to run at. It's a beautiful piece of engineering, Matt, oh, yes. isn't it? Two-cylinder, a compound steam engine, producing 120 horsepower. Do you enjoy it? You feel like she's yours? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, they become they're something that's alive. Essentially, you feed them, you water them, you boil them, but they've got their own personality almost, you know. How many hours a day do you spend down here? Up to an eight-hour day sometimes, depending on where we need to get to. Better at the end of the day, you're dying for a beer. Absolutely. <laughs> Makes it taste good too. I love the beauty and the precision of pieces of engineering like this. All these interconnected parts all working together. And you know, if you look after engines like this, keep them maintained and oiled, they can last forever. It's a magnificent testimony to the ingenuity of the human race. I love them. They're like works of art. Now this feels really good steering this puffer. Now I'm heading through the Doris Moor, which is the open gate or the gateway in Gaelic. Um, and it's seemingly quite tricky. We've got to watch out for a, a wee sailing boat over there because it'd be a much bigger and butcher than they are. And I wouldn't like to be responsible for anyone's deaths at sea. <laughs> you know, you know, all over Scotland, um, the puffers are held in great affection by people everywhere, no matter what, what, where, where you come from. And most of that, most of the knowledge comes from the fictional characterizations of Neil Munro and his creations of the wonderful tales of Parahandy and the most famous puffer of them all, the Vital Spark. It was when the tales of the Vital Spark first appeared that the Clyde Puffer sailed into immortality. They were written over a hundred years ago by Glasgow-based journalist Neil Munro. Munro walked the banks of this river at a time when the Clyde was teeming with puffers, and he spotted their potential as a way to fill a few column inches. Now, these are copies of the long gone Glasgow Evening News. And in here, we should find the first ever, yes, Parahandy story. So, on Monday, the 16th of January, 1905, a new and enduring fictional character hit the Scottish literary scene. <laughs> a short, thick-set man with a red beard, a hard, round felt hat, ridiculously out of harmony with a blue pilot jacket and trousers and a seaman's jersey. <laughs> Parahandy, Master Mariner, had arrived. These stories were a huge hit with the Glasgow public and they became part of Glasgow life. They were serialised until 1923, that's 18 years, a very, very long time. And they were also published in book form. And that was over 100 years ago. And since then, these books have never, ever been out of print. And that is a quite extraordinary, quite remarkable achievement for any writer. The retired BBC man, Guthrie Hutton, was part of the team who worked on the most famous adaptation of them all. A sitcom starring Roddy McMillan as roguish skipper Para Handy. Oh, yes, yes. That tune as well. Look at the size of it. So we had to put that, that white line around her because she was the smartest boat in the trade and she had that white line. And the white line, of course, was just two-inch masking tape. 
Originally shot in black and white in the 60s, the show starred a host of the finest Scottish actors of the day and left us with the most enduring image of a puffer and her crew. Well, that's wonderful to There's see that, Prince actually. Grand. Yes, it's great stuff. Designer Guthrie Hutton. Oh, I've got to remember that, adorning the socks. <laughs> Lady Cynthia sings <laughs> again. <laughs> That's the word I'd use, furtive. Furtive. <laughs> it's the way he kind of spits it out, it's wonderful. Our hand has been furtive ever since we left Inverary. The scripts were so good they were filmed again, almost shot for shot, in colour, in the 1970s. There's not a damn thing wrong with the boiler. If I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times, the hail engines need a complete overhaul. Well, they're not going in for an overhaul. That's scrapped, that's what the man scrapped. Come here. You see, those fingers can ruin and ruin. Aye. They should be up and doing <laughs> What have you got there? Well, well these, these are uh, some pages of, of camera script from 14th of November 1965. Episode one, the quarrel. They strike fighting poses. Jim heads for the door. I'm going to get Doogie. It'll take more than Doogie to separate us. Separate you? I want to see the fight. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Ah, oh, it's not right for the master of the vessel to fight with a common stoker. 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 <laughs> when you were making the programmes in those days, did you realise that they would become so popular? Yes, we knew it would be popular, I guess, because the Parahandy stories... Uh, were really have, funny. Have, ...have been popular since Neil Munro wrote them. This is Inverary, the hometown of Neil Munro, the creator of the Vital Spark. He was born in the mid-19th century, so he was here during the heyday of the puffer trade, and he was heavily influenced by what he saw and all the wonderful characters that he met. This is one of the last remaining puffers. She was originally called the Ellen Easdale, but then she was renamed the Vital Spark in tribute to Neil Monroe and his original creation. She was one of the last working puffers into the mid-90s. I think it's great that she's birthed here at Neil Monroe's hometown, the writer of the Vital Spark. currently sailing through the mouth of Loch Melfort. But if you look way behind me, you see in the distance the Paps of Jura, those distinctive peaks. To the left of them is a little slither of land coming out of the mist. That's Isla. And Isla plays an important part in the story of the puffer. And it was a favorite port for all those seamen who worked in the puffer trade. Because you see, going to Isla meant they were never very far away from a drop of the hard stuff. Isla was the puffer island par excellence with its distilleries and whatnot. It was the centre of the puffer kingdom. I went to a wedding here once, it was three days before we got sober. <laughs> Look at that view, isn't it paradise? I've been coming to this island for years, I've got lots of friends here, I think it's a magical place. And it's famous for Scotland's greatest export. Whiskey. Isla is only 16 miles long, but still has eight working distilleries. It's a powerhouse of whisky production, vital to the local and national economy. Because the whisky all went out with a puffer and the coal came in to fire the boilers and whatever else. It was all, it's one of the mainstays for the puffers. The whisky made here is famous the world over, and this global trade was once utterly dependent on puffers. There were shipments of them, um, large shipments of whiskey going out, so they would take them from here to Glasgow and then they would be exported from there. 
every time they left they were taking out thousands and tens of thousands of pounds. So the puffers were like armoured carriers taking mm -hmm. money out. It was liquid yeah. gold, you know what I mean? It was so, so important. Now I have here a wonderful old ledger. It's the account of the arrivals and sailings of ships to and from Isla. And it's got everything marked. The headlight, the Spartan. You've got the Warlight, the Dorothy, the Petro. Page after page of dozens and dozens of entries of the arrivals and departures of puffers. I've actually seen three puffers discharging or charging at Port Turner Harbour and another three waiting Aye. in the bay to come in. I was so busy. Employment-wise, it was just phenomenal. I was a driver. We had about half a dozen lorries and what all we did every day was empty puffers. Coal, barley, malt, barrels. It was just, every day was a, an adventure. Yeah, whiskey and puffers were just, it was a great match. It was really, really good because the characters involved. And we used to go up to the cellars, we loved that run. Because for buying else, we always got a good drama of the local whiskey when it was getting brewed. The white stuff. The white stuff. <laughs> Believe me, it was dynamite. It was absolutely potent. And I got this. They all drank it down. Well, ten minutes later, I didn't know which planet I was on. Oh, dear, oh, dear. It wasn't just ordinary whiskey. This was very, very strong. It was pure spirits, about 160% proof. <laughs> so I, st I slept till the next day because that stuff was just far too strong. We couldn't go at all, so we diluted it with a bottle of sherry and it was quite nice. And they were pretty handy at uh, opening up a barrel or two, weren't they? Oh, well, that's a terrible thing to say about yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> How did you manage to get the whiskey from the barrels, Jimmy? Oh, that was a very well kept secret amongst the fuffermen. But when they were carrying it, <laughs> I hope nobody's listening now, but we used to wee drill and we'd shaped pegs of the same type of wood as a barrel. Did a wee hole in the barrel. And we used to drain out maybe a quarter or maybe half a pint, just no more. We plug in and bung them home, make it all dirty again. And done that with two or three barrels of milk. We used to get a bottle each of whiskey out of the pot. I was sent up to the shop to get lemonade. And the skipper says, get a case. So I had this case of lemonade. Oh, he says, son, he says, do you like lemonade? He says, well, start drinking, he says. He wasn't wanting the lemonade, he was wanting the bottles. <laughs> so they're going to be filled with the <laughs> illegal whiskey. Huh? <coughs> but that was illegal, and it was good fun. That was just for Christmas and New Year. Living on an isolated Scottish island or an isolated Highland community has its challenges, but can you imagine what it was like 100, 150 years ago? So what you couldn't get from the land or fish from the sea had to be brought in from outside, from the mainland, and the puffers were vital. Especially if you made produce, or you were a trader in any way, the puffers were your connection to the outside world. The puffer was a lifeline service, absolutely essential to island life. The big, bigger vessels couldn't get into places where they've got no harbour as such. The puffers were the job for that. Those years were amazing. I mean, nothing came into the island unless it came really by, by puffer. You know, now a boat, if it's if a breeze, the boat doesn't sail. In those days, they would come in and horrendous weather. Horrendous weather. They sailed. No, they're hard working guys. You've got to give them their due. You know, if you look down going up the street towards you, you run. You see, this is a rough lot, this. They're salt of the earth away. Really were. There were some really nice people. They had this name for being um, hard drinkers, wild men. They weren't. They were hard workers. They spent long hours at sea. Um, on ships with no navigational aids, and wind and weather never stopped them. The, the puffers had to go anywhere, carry anything ethos. And they would go to parts of Scotland that other boats couldn't reach, but they also had one more trick up their sleeve that made them absolutely perfect for the West Coast communities they serviced. A lot of, uh, 
islands and out on the west coast then it appears. So you beach on the beach. The genius of the puffer meant that they could deliberately beach themselves right in the heart of the communities they served. Oh, we did a lot of beach work, did you? Oh, I. That was must a... have been a tricky operation. You really needed to have a, a, an exact knowledge of the tides and the beginning oh, of the aye, sea, Oh, didn't yeah, you? very much so. The first time you went to the beach, you had a loaded puffer, so you could ram it as far up. You really come in at full speed. A high tide. A high tide. And sitting there, you tied me out and you unload. The beach work was all tractors and trailers. In the old days, it was horses and carts, you know. A farmer would go down with a, a boogie and a horse, and that was their year's supply of coal. That was carted away to the farm or wherever it was. And then you would hear clankety, 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 clank. And then when, the, when it was just above the trailer, the big bucket would be tipped, and you'd hear this colossal rumble of coal falling onto the wood of the trailer. I'll never forget it, never ever. And looking back, I thought of these men as heroes, coming with these wee boats to the islands, doing such good work, maintaining the island economy. It wasn't the best of jobs beach work because you worked at night, you to work tides and work down in a hole shoveling coal at hours in the morning, two and three in the morning and things like that and you try to get a, a bit of a bite of food in between and then a sleep and then you're back up two or three hours later again for the next tide. So I really, I wasn't impressed too much with the beach work, you know. Now this seemingly gentle act of beaching had its dangers and you needed years of skill and experience to pull it off because if you hit something like this, you would be in real trouble. This lovely little picture is of the puffer called the Roman, which is beached at Butte. And if you look round the ship, you see all sorts of little rocks on the beach there, which just shows you that deliberately beaching them, as the puffer skippers had to do, was a very dangerous occupation. So how did they manage that time after time without damaging the boat? Well, the answer lies in this logbook. It's a handwritten beach book from 1933. And it gives you a window into the past. Now, these books contain all the information you need to work the West Coast's little inlets, where it's best to make sure if you needed a beach and discharge your cargo, and more importantly, where to avoid if you didn't want to damage your hull. Good beach inside first two islands on starboard side. Spring tides required. Right, now let's look at this entry here. It's from Captain Mac O'Wain, and he's describing Loch Fechan. <laughs> he said, keep your vessels clear, dangerous. Now, if you think about it, the information contained in these little books is absolutely vital. I bet they were like gold dust, they were like Bibles. In these days, there was no qualification certificates to get. It was based on local knowledge. They knew where every rock was and they knew where there wasn't rocks. They knew where they could shelter and they each had their own wee favourite place they could go. The other thing I remember about them is what marvellous seamen they were. They really were. They were first class boat handlers. First class. Very difficult to steer. No hydraulic gear, just an ordinary chain drive. But it was extremely hard to steer. Even when you were a young skipper, you think, how do I do this and how do I do that? Experienced men, you tell you. They were seamen by experience. They started as I started, as, as a deckhand, and they learned the ropes. That's where the expression comes, learning the ropes. This intimate knowledge of the waters they sailed was absolutely crucial because life on the seas around Scotland was dangerously unpredictable. It was a lot of really frightening times, and especially, you wouldn't directly go out in a gale of wind, but you could easily have get caught in one, and you had to make the best of it. But a loaded puffer, what I would term as a half-tide rock, it doesn't, you know, you know a half-tide rock, and the sea just rolling over the top of it, well, that's what a loaded puffer would resemble. But uh, 
We just went out nowhere, you know. There's a lot about the. Uh, it was a frightening job, you know. It was stormy weather all the time. When the boat was rolling, you could lose it. If you hadn't got your sea line, you could quite easily be washed overboard. Because the water's heavy and it would just take you off your feet and put you over the side. But they're very, very sturdy boats and they could handle it. As long as the hold was backing down, you know, water got in, they were reasonably quite safe. The one I was on before I came on to this, that sunk going over to Liverpool. The hatch covers moved and it sunk and she capsized and drowned half the crew. Really, what was her name? That was the Druid. A number of them that sank, that founded, that sprung a leak, uh, was, was remarkable. Uh, well, one just, just like a Vic, like this one, she was sunk in the Irish Sea, as early with all hands. It was Hogmanay in 1953. She was left Carnlock at night. She was never saw, never seen again. Just disappeared? Just disappeared. It's somewhere in the Irish Sea, probably. Stories of boats sinking, um, running aground. The attrition rate on these boats was enormous. Lifeboat out to grounded coaster. Divers hunt for coaster's crew. All five members of the crew lost their lives. And when they found the ship, there was no visible signs of damage. They had just disappeared. If she is undamaged, then she will sail again, said a spokesman for the Glen Light Shipping Company. Aye, the ship may sail again, but the sailors won't. We never thought it was dangerous. You just never thought of it. It was there, we'd done it and worked away on it. The puffer and her crews had proven themselves to be brave and resilient. And during Britain's greatest hour of need, this would not go unnoticed. At the start of World War II, the Admiralty needed a versatile supply boat to service its fleets and the wider war effort. And they didn't have to look very far, because the perfect boat was the puffer. With its massive cargo capacity, these hardy little boats very quickly became vital to Britain's war effort. In the war, they were very, very useful for servicing warships. You used them to take out water, you used them to take out um, food, um, stores, anything that the big boats needed. The Navy had found the boat it needed. They took the latest Scottish designs and ordered 100 brand new puffers. Only two were built in Scotland though. The rest of the ordered Vicks were made by English yards. Each of them were given their own number and were designated the title Victualling Inshore Craft, the Vicks. They were to be seen wherever you had fleets in need of service. There was another reason the Navy chose the puffer. The Vicks were remarkable for the use of steam propulsion at a time when diesel engines were taking over and being installed in all crafts of similar size. It was quite simple. Coal, unlike diesel, didn't have to be imported or processed, freeing up the supplies of diesel for the ships of war. So the puffer was pressed into war service. It was called up in effect and then these puffers came back to Scotland. At the end of the war, the Admiralty had no more need of the Vicks, so they flooded the market with them and they were snapped up by many a buyer. You could buy them for about 2,000 pounds. That was less than half the price of a new build. And they were all less than eight years old, so a pretty damn good bargain. But in fact, the purchasing of this new fleet of steam engine puffers was what sowed the seed for the demise of the puffer trade. At that time, they should have been going into diesel uh, rather than steam, rather than coal. Uh, diesel being much, a much more efficient, more efficient way of propulsion. Way, absolutely. Each puffer carried a massive boiler. To feed that boiler, they carried 12 tons of water. They also carried 12 tons of coal. So that means that each puffer gave up in space and dead weight a massive amount. No match for the economies of diesel. 
I originally was a steam engineer. I served my time as a steam engineer. But I switched to diesel earlier on. I didn't like steam puffers, but too warm and smelly and dirty. So in the early 1960s, these puffers were remodelled, given diesel engines, and they changed completely compared with the old ones that I knew. After a hundred glorious years, the golden age of the steam puffer had finally come to an end. If boats like our old friend the Spartan, which had been built for the war, were to have any kind of future, they had to convert to diesel. The capacity needed for storing coal and such like was put to other use then. Quite often they extended the hold a wee bit to carry a wee bit more cargo. It was very economical, easy to work with. Despite the late attempts at modernisation, the tide was turning against the puffer. Inland improvements to roads and a subsidised rail network finally put pay to the Forth and Clyde Canal as an economically viable cargo route. In January 1963, the waterway that had been the birthplace of the puffer was closed to all traffic. The demise of the puffer was slow but it was sure. With no inland trade available, the puffers now became entirely dependent on work from the islands. However, the puffer was about to meet a challenge it could not face. In the late 60s, a strange new craft appeared out of the mist. The trade was about to be destroyed by a futuristic monster. The first fleet of Scottish roll-on, roll-off ferries had now been launched. Bobby, well, it must have been a fairly devastating effect that the roll-on, roll-off ferries had in the puffer trade. Oh, it definitely did, especially the, 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 the whisky, the distillery. They went on to articulated lorries carrying over the barley and taking out the, the whisky. You could put almost a puffer's worth inside a big container put it on wheels and tow it on board a ferry. And the crews and the puffers couldn't run then. So they started selling puffers and started selling amalgamating companies. But their lorries killed it eventually after that. They didn't need the puffers no more. So when the roll-on roll-off ferries come in, it was, uh, especially in Isla, it must have been a big change. Yeah, right? the writing was on the wall. Yeah. Oh, it definitely was. A lot of folks say it was uh, the best thing that happened to the island was the whole on, but not for me, not for a lot of folk. Changes must have just, been brutal. It was just brutal. I mean, as for the company, we had uh, probably seven, eight, nine lorries, and that just died away in a year. Did you sense it was coming to the end of yeah, a year? Yeah, that's the way from the roof, and I, I left them in the sort of late 60s, early 70s. I said, you know, there was changes on here, you know. New roll-on, roll-off ferries would keep on coming and they would prove to be a disaster for the puffers. And just as the puffers themselves had once killed the trade in horse-drawn canal traffic and cargo-carrying sailing scows, their days were numbered. They were about to become obsolete. Uh, a lot of the roads and a lot of the ferry terminals and a lot of the boats even were built with uh, public subsidy and uh, that, that meant that these little coastal boats operating as private uh, business couldn't compete. And the competition element then became unfair. With only a handful of vessels remaining, the puffers limped on till the early 90s. But finally, a trade which had been part of a coastal tradition for over 140 years sank completely. Anyway, I joined the puffers. That was in 1966. And it was there right up to their demise. That was it. There you are. But what a shock to the system that was. Spending a couple of days in the VIC-32 has been a real treat for me. Uh, 
It's been a joy. I never thought I would, I would see the day when I would have that opportunity. It's been lovely because it's, it's a very tangible boat. It's there, it's real, it's, it's visceral, it's, it's sweaty, it's oily, it's noisy, it's mechanical, it's engineering at its best for its day. Um, it's got a personality. It's got a very, very strong personality and a lovely one at that. It's been like an adventure. Currently, the Vic 32 is the last of the ocean-going steam puffers on Scottish waters. But very shortly, she might just have an ally on the water with her. This is old Ricky. She's currently undergoing a major rebuilding and renovation program, which hopefully means the Vic 32 will have a sister ship. You know, we think of puffers as short, stubby little boats, but when you see them out of the water like this, you realize the sheer scale of them. They're magnificent. Like the Vic 32, Old Ricky was built for the Navy during World War II and then sold back to Scotland. After her working life, she was used as a training vessel for youth clubs before narrowly avoiding the scrapyard. She's now being brought back to life by a dedicated team at the Crinan Boatyard. This is the refurbished engine of Old Ricky. They've done a grand job with it. Almost like new. I'd love to see her working, but that won't happen until next year. They hope, with a wing and a prayer. What a wonderful thought that another one of these boats could very soon be back on Scottish waters. <laughs> Those stubby, chunky little ships, for over a hundred years, they would carry anything and go anywhere. We're a regular sight on this river, and I'm a Glaswegian, and I'm deeply, deeply proud of our great shipbuilding heritage. We built some of the greatest ships the world has ever seen, but I bet most of us would say, the one that we hold dearest to our hearts is the little Clyde Puffer. The Puffer filled a niche in Scottish life. But I think it went further than that. It filled a niche in Scottish identity. And it represented a Scottish solution to a Scottish problem. And it was built and manned by Scots. And, you know, Scotland is the poorer for the passing of the puffer and the people who were the puffer men. And that was the story of life in the puffers. Worked, slept and played hard chase women when we get the chance. You should know everybody never knew us. So there you are. Thank That's you, Jimmy. Like, thank you. Pleasure. You may have got a wee story out of that. <laughs>. Stay with us here on BBC4. Neil Oliver's History of Ancient Britain continues in just a moment as we take up tools and head out into the fields. We don't want to injure your feelings But take it for me You'll never, never see Only place of St. Bro as the heel